Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd first like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's Roseworthy, uh, North Terrace, Waite and Thabiton campuses are built. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you here uh, tonight to, to this free public talk, which is the latest in our Research Tuesdays series. I'm Professor Robert Saint, Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research Strategy, and uh, I'm here acting on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Bebbington. Research Tuesdays are an opportunity for the university's many outstanding academic leaders and researchers to share with the community the work they're doing, and for us to better understand what the future holds, because that's what research is about, changing the future and understanding the future. Tonight's topic is something that affects us all, and it's an area that we hope will have a much brighter future. I'm talking about the health of our hearts. It's really a pleasure to be here for this Research Tuesday's presentation because we'll be hearing from someone who's not only playing an important role right here at the university in terms of uh, heart health, but he's also one of the theme leaders in health research for the whole of South Australia. Stephen Nichols returned to Australia within the, uh, within the last couple of years, um, uh, I believe, to take up the positions of Professor of Cardiology at the University of Adelaide, Consultant Cardiologist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and the Heart Foundation Heart, theme, health, uh, heart health Theme Leader at the new South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute that we warmly regard to, uh, uh, refer to as SAMRI these days. Steve's also the Deputy Director of SAMRI, so he uh, is in a very important leadership position uh, for health research in the state. Steve's links with the University of Adelaide go back to his undergraduate days. He graduated with a medical degree at this university and also he, uh, um, he completed his PhD here. Steve's a world-class researcher who has looked at issues such as the build-up of plaque in the blood, uh, in blood vessels which can lead to heart attack and stroke. And importantly, throughout his career, he's been at the all-important nexus between research and clinical work. He's held a number of senior, ro senior roles at both the clinical and academic levels in Australia and overseas, including at the world-renowned Cleveland Clinic in the USA. We're delighted that Steve has returned to Adelaide and more particularly to the University of Adelaide and to Samri, where he's continuing his outstanding work in cardiology. Would you please welcome Professor Steve Nichols. What I'm going to talk about in the next hour, 40 minutes or so is, is really the advances in what we understand about heart disease, uh, how we've come to the point of what we do with a heart attack to date, and, and then a little bit of a glimpse into the future um, in terms of where we may go with our therapeutics beyond that. This slide summarises my disclosures. I work for a lot of pharmaceutical companies uh, that uh, develop new therapies uh, for cardiovascular disease. Uh, so here's the sobering reality of the next hour that we spend together. About 2,000 people on this planet will have a heart attack. About 500 of them will die suddenly with no warning whatsoever. And at least 500 of these individuals will have had no symptoms prior to the first instance in which they had their heart attack. So this remains a significant issue worldwide. And, and I'm going to kind of frame at least the summary of this challenge around the good, the bad and the ugly. Here's the good news, and over the last two to three decades, we've seen a profound reduction in age-related mortality due to coronary artery disease uh, in Western countries as a result of the combination of both uh, preventive measures, but most importantly, aggressive management of these high-risk individuals once they reach the hospital. Uh, and we've seen this plummeting of mortality rates accordingly. Unfortunately, the bad news is the mortality rates are about as the same as cancer. In fact, we read in the newspaper about two weeks ago that cancer is now the leading cause of death in Australia. Um, one might have uh, been mistaken in reading those articles to think that we'd won the war on heart disease. Heart disease is a, a close second, but essentially we're talking about while we've reduced the mortality rates due to heart disease, the reality is that there still continue to be a lot of individuals in our community who will ultimately succumb uh, due to cardiovascular disease. And then really what's the major concern for many of us, and the ugly news is that while mortality rates have plummeted in Western affluent nations due to cardiovascular disease, in fact the mortality rates due to heart disease and stroke worldwide uh, have disappointingly increased, and, and largely they've done that 
because we've seen a global spread of abdominal obesity and type 2 diabetes. This slide summarises projections of the increase in prevalence of type 2 diabetes largely due to obesity worldwide. And you see the major concern is the increase in these metabolic factors and consequent cardiovascular risk in parts of the world in which cardiovascular disease has not traditionally been a problem. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, East and Southern Asia massive increases in metabolic disease and consequent cardiovascular risk uh, in, these, in these parts of the world have really driven the problem that cardiovascular disease is not only a global problem, but in fact it is now the leading cause of death worldwide. Uh, uh, while cancer may be number one in this country, uh, from an affluent perspective, this is the leading cause of death uh, throughout the world. On top of that, we know that there's an enormous cost from heart disease within our country. If you add up all the people that get admitted to hospital, all of the lab tests that are performed, all the medications that are prescribed both to prevent the heart disease from forming in the first place and then trying to prevent a second uh, event from occurring, all of the tests that we perform on patients in our daily practice and ultimately all of those procedures, that adds up to a lot of money. In fact, cardiovascular disease continues to be the single largest drain on public health care expenditure in this country, uh, accounting for somewhere in the order of about 11% of all health care costs. So it, it has enormous impact, not only in terms of the morbidity and mortality, but it's costing our country an enormous amount of money. Um, so what causes heart attacks? And you know, the story really has evolved from that of being a simple plumbing problem. Uh, this is the atherosclerotic plaque. It builds up slowly within the wall of the vessel, uh, within the coronary arteries. We know that it can build up in a number of arterial beds. I'm going to focus predominantly on the blood vessels that supply the heart. Uh, but what we've really learned is that it's a complicated process. So I'm going to focus on two seminal observations that were both really made in the first decade of the 20th century, but they really have driven the way that we've thought about this process and the way that we've gone about trying to predict the risk and secondly, how we've tried to reduce cardiovascular risk uh, overall in the community. And the first is this concept that cholesterol is intimately linked to the formation of plaques within the vessel wall and the increased risk of heart attack and stroke. This is Nikolai Anichkov. He was a young medical student in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, and he came up with this very simple idea. He thought, well, if there's a link between cholesterol and atherosclerosis, then I should be able to prove it. What he did was he took some rabbits and he fed them a high cholesterol diet. And what you see on this slide are the drawings of what he saw when he first looked down the microscope and looked at the walls of the aortas of those animals. And what you see are the classic lipid-laden foam cells. These are the major cells that we find within the atherosclerotic plaque. We know they drive the disease process. And they were simply there because he fed these animals cholesterol. The second observation actually links what happens in the middle of the artery as opposed to the wall. And the concept that heart attacks occur largely because you block a blood vessel off because you form a blood clot within it. And, and you know, there were many theories for centuries about why heart attacks occurred. But it was really James Herrick in the early 20th century that really kind of, kind of joined the dots and, and in, on a combination of both clinical experience and looking at autopsy samples, was really able to uh, quite elegantly describe this concept that heart attack patients typically have blood clots that form within the arteries and that these block the vessels and that that's something that very well could be targeted and the concept that not everybody with a heart attack necessarily drops dead it could give us an enormous opportunity we know that this is a chronic process it forms in the walls of arteries over the course of decades this is not a disease that starts when you're in your mid 50s and you first have some symptoms the reality is, in fact, that we see very early changes in the artery wall occurring in childhood and adolescence. We see this grass, gra gradual accumulation of disease over the course of the decades. Uh, many plaques will form within the artery walls, and for the majority of those plaques in all of our arteries, they'll never cause a problem. But the occasional plaque does cause a problem and causes a heart attack. So what's some of the evidence that we have to support this? The first is that we now have been able to use artery wall imaging and we've been able to show the presence of substantial atherosclerosis within the walls of the arteries at a young age. So we've used intravascular ultrasound, the ability to put 
a very small ultrasound transducer on the tip of a catheter and place it within the coronary arteries, the arteries that give the blood and the oxygen and the nutrients to the heart muscle. And that's really provided a very valuable tool in understanding the natural history of the disease. We've also been able to use it to monitor heart transplant recipients. We know that the single biggest complications of having a heart transplant are rejection and the development of a proliferative narrowing within those vessels. And so standard of care in individuals who undergo a heart transplant is to actually image their vessels immediately after having the operation and then to do it on a 12 monthly basis. Because if we see early changes occur in the vessel wall, then we will be more aggressive in the way that we target the treatment for these heart transplant recipients. But if I take you back to that very first imaging study that they have, these are individuals who are imaged within three or four weeks of having a heart transplant. Those transplanted hearts are allegedly healthy. They are taken largely from motor vehicle accident victims who are uh, diagnosed with brain death in the intensive care unit, who allegedly have healthy hearts, and when we image their arteries, we see large plaques, not just early cholesterol findings, large plaques in one in six teenagers. And we see the prevalence of the disease increase in an in a exponential fashion with age. So this is not a disease that starts in your 50s. It's a disease that starts early in life. And that has enormous implications with the problems of childhood obesity that we face in our community. Uh, and try, you know, so the horse will bolt and the, the childhood obesity of today will be the early heart attacks and the type 2 diabetes uh, in the early 30s uh, and re represents enormous problems. So what do we understand actually happens in the vessel wall? We have a normal artery wall and two fundamental processes happen. You have uh, a, a migration of inflammatory cells from the circulating blood into the vessel wall and you have a migration of cholesterol into the, into the artery wall as well. So higher levels of cholesterol in the blood are clearly going to result in more migration of cholesterol into the artery wall on these LDL particles. We know that those particles will undergo oxidation and those oxidised particles and their cholesterol will be quickly taken up by those inflammatory cells. And it's those inflammatory cells in the wall of the artery that now are in kind of uh, gorging on cholesterol that forms the foam cell. It's what a Nitschkov saw in the walls of the rabbits, and these are the early changes that we see in the artery wall with atherosclerosis. Uh, this process just continues to be a self-propagating cycle. There's more migration of inflammatory cells, there's more accumulation of cholesterol. We start to see the formation of a strong roof over the plaque that separates the plaque from the circulating blood, the so-called fibrous cap. This is the kind of plaques that we all have in our arteries, and the reality is those nice, big, strong plaques are unlikely to cause any problem whatsoever. Unfortunately, for some individuals, a given plaque is going to rupture, and what's going to happen in those individuals is that strong, fibrous cap, that roof that separates the plaque from the blood, is going to rupture. It's going to weaken, and it's going to rupture, and suddenly it's going to expose the contents of the plaque to the circulating blood, that's going to be a highly potent stimulus to form blood clots, and those blood clots will block off the hole in the middle of the artery, block off the blood supply to the tissue, and cause uh, tissue death. Uh, so we know that uh, there are a number of abnormalities that we observe both in the blood and in the plaque that contribute to the way that these blood clots form. This very much kind of drives the way that we treat our patients with heart attacks, and I'll show that later on. This concept that most of the early treatment very much is directed at trying to reduce the extent of those blood clots in these vessels. And then ultimately, we're going to have a situation with a blocked vessel and blood with its oxygen and nutrients not able to get through to a region of heart muscle, and the heart muscle will die. So you can appreciate the challenges in terms of trying to limit that tissue injury and very much driving the process that we've tried to reinforce with public education about getting to hospital early. We give this concept of time as muscle. Uh, the earlier you can get to hospital with chest pain, the earlier we can initiate 
these blood thinning treatments, the greater the likelihood that we'll reduce the amount of damage to the heart muscle. And that will have enormous implications because we ultimately know that patients who have very large heart attacks will develop heart failure. They'll have their, their hearts will change their size and shape. On the right here, you see the left ventricle in red. It no longer has that kind of small, neat uh, kind of appearance. It becomes a big, floppy heart. The walls thin out. The chamber kind of dilates. This is a heart that no longer is going to work properly. These are the individuals who present with heart failure. They're at a greater risk of having nasty heart rhythms that will cause sudden death. And they're at a greater risk of developing clots within those chambers those clots can fly off and cause strokes. So if we can minimise the amount of tissue damage that occurs in the setting of a heart attack, then clearly we can reduce the likelihood of those complications. Now, one of the major great breakthroughs has been the concept of being able to actually look at the arteries. Uh, this is something that has developed over the course of many decades, and it's kind of a process which started off with some cowboys and actually then led to kind of more solid science. This is Werner Forsman, uh, who did ele elegant studies in Germany in the 20s. He thought that you should be able to deliver a catheter into the heart. And in fact, what you see on the left here is a catheter, that little white line that's been fed up through the subclavian vein, goes all the way up, goes around that loop, and it's sitting in the right atrium of the heart. Now what's really interesting is that's some procedure he's done on himself. So Forsman thought this would be a great idea and went to his departmental chief and said, I'd like to do this on a patient. And the, the departmental chief said, you can go back to the dog lab and do it there. Uh, he decided he didn't want to do that in dogs anymore and so he needed a willing accomplice. So he found a young nurse who he thought would be a, a great assistant and convinced her to go along with the exercise and she volunteered uh, to actually be his uh, guinea pig. Uh, he lied her down on a hospital bed, administered local anaesthetic to her arm and while she wasn't really paying attention, what he actually did was catheterise himself. Uh, and then turned around and told her that and asked her to m wheel him down to radiology and, and, and take the x-ray that you see there. So. Uh, these are the types of cowboys that my field unfortunately has kind of its humble beginnings uh, kind of attached to, but it really represents the very first foray into being able to deliver um, a catheter uh, to the heart. Now the next part of this process was could we actually develop, deliver a catheter to the coronary arteries themselves? Could we inject a dye down the coronary arteries and actually look at the patterns of disease. We do that every day in clinical practice. We do coronary angiograms worldwide. They've helped us diagnose obstructive disease. They enable for us to triage our patients to medical therapy, bypass surgery, stents. Uh, but the real concern was in the late 50s was everybody was afraid to, to directly inject anything into the coronary arteries. There was a real concern that in fact if you did that you'd precipitate sudden death. Um, what you see on the right here is in fact the very first shot of the right coronary artery, the very first coronary angiogram. It was by Mason Soans at the Cleveland Clinic and it was a complete accident. Um, Mason Soans was doing a left and right heart catheter on a young uh, adult male with mild intellectual impairment looking for uh, a workup for valve disease, measuring the pressures in the heart, injected contrast into what he thought was the aorta and quickly appreciated that in fact that wasn't the aorta and that was the right coronary artery. This is a time that preceded CPR, it preceded uh, automatic defibrillators. The only way to resuscitate a patient at that point in time was in fact to cut their chest open and to perform internal cardiac massage and that's in fact what Sones went to do. Sones turned around for the scalpel and went to cut the patient open. The patient sat up and said what was going on with the knife. Um, <laughs> And while many of us perhaps would have been somewhat concerned with the events that had transpired that day, uh, in fact, Soans on reflection realised that, in fact, what I've just done is I've just proven everybody wrong. I've directed, directly in direct, injected something into the coronary arteries. Patient didn't have an abnormal heart rhythm whatsoever uh, and organised for three patients to come back. Uh, to the cath lab in the next few days for coronary angiography and, and, and thus a procedure w which we take for granted in clinical practice uh, was born uh, at that point in time. We've been able to use that uh, 
very much to tr uh, triage patients uh, to important treatments uh, that really um, at least palliate uh, their obstructive disease. The bypass surgery that was uh, initiated in the early 60s and then perfected over the course of the next 10 years remains the gold standard in the way that we really treat coronary disease. It doesn't fix the underlying disease, but it bypasses the blockages. And those bypassing the blockages are important in terms of symptom relief for the patients in whom we can't settle down with medications. Uh, for patients with uh, widespread severe disease and heart failure, there, are, there are clearly is a mortality benefit uh, from using these procedures. And so the ability to look at the arteries, to be able to define the pattern and the extent of those narrowings was really critical in being able to enable for us to be able to do that procedure. And that real procedure really was the mainstay of the way that we treated um, obstructive disease until the early 80s, when a number of cardiologists really moved forward with the concept of could we put a catheter actually within the artery? Could we put a balloon on the end of that catheter and could we blow the lesion up? Uh, this is not a treatment that we can use for patients who have blockages everywhere, but it very much became a treatment option for the individual who has a focal high-grade narrowing. The idea that we could just simply stretch the vessel open. Now, the, the early days that was associated with a high complication rate. It was associated with a lot of kind of rupturing of blood vessels. A lot of the arteries kind of recoiled down. We had a lot of problems with complications in the early days. But really that then led to the advent of the stent. The idea, well, could we blow it up with a balloon? And then could we deliver a bit of metal scaffolding, which we're going to inflate up right up against the vessel wall and keep it open. The stent will stay in there forever uh, and keep the artery open. And, and, and really, again, the next step, the next revolution in our ability to treat obstructive disease. Now, you know, the catheter-based approaches uh, uh, predominate in terms of our approach. We use these approaches in the middle of the night. We have good data to suggest that if you have a heart attack in the middle of the night, and you get to hospital quickly, the absolute best thing that we can do is open our cath lab and bring our team in and open your artery up. Time is muscle. The best way to open the artery is to use a balloon and a stent. And again, it's all been the follow through of the ability to look at the arteries to deliver those catheters. And so it's really the gift that those cowboys uh, in the 20s and the 50s uh, were able to give us. Now, where do we go with imaging beyond that? We, you know, we, we keep in mind that really all the angiogram does us is show the narrowings in the arteries. It actually doesn't image the walls of the vessel at all. And we know that the plaques build up in the wall of the vessel. The narrowings are simply a complication. So there's been enormous interest by our group and many others to use a range of new techniques, both invasive and non-invasive, that really now give a completely different way of looking at plaque. They can show the early changes. They can show fully established disease. Some of them use light, some of them use sound, some of them use different near-infrared spectroscopic techniques. We can see how much plaque's in the wall of the vessel. We can distinguish the different components of the plaque, so we can distinguish those kind of cholesterol and inflamed parts of the plaque that are more likely to rupture. We can actually now start to look at the functional activity of the plaque. We can now use the new cyclotron that we have in the basement at Samory, the first in the state to be able to take our imaging of plaques to a completely different level and actually now start imaging the actual factors that are involved in the translation of those nice big chunky plaques with the strong roofs over the top of them to the ones that rupture and cause the acute events at two o'clock in the morning. Um, a lot of what we've known came from, a, 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 and a lot of what we've done uh, really stem from a number of seminal events. Again, you know, it was a really golden era of cardiology that went from about 1955 to 1965 where a number of significant uh, events occurred that have changed what we've done. The first is the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, the National Institutes of Health in the United States had uh, put some money aside to uh, study uh, the factors associated with neurodegenerative conditions in Pennsylvania. And it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt who had a significant stroke and died in 1945 that really woke uh, the politicians in Washington up to the significance of cardiovascular disease. And some opportunistic uh, researchers at Harvard uh, 
managed to convince them that their money was going to be wasted studying neurologic conditions in Pennsylvania and what they really needed to do was to study the factors that drove heart disease and stroke. And so the money was moved from a town in Pennsylvania to the town of Framingham, Massachusetts, which is about one of the whitest uh, towns in America, home of one of the IBM factories, uh, but home of an incredibly patient uh, cohort of families who now have had three or four generations take part in what's really been the landmark study uh, associating risk factors and cardiovascular risk, the Framingham Heart Study. It's told us most of what we know. Um, the results are not perfect, but it really has advanced um, the way that we predict risk and the way that we uh, try to treat our patients. The second seminal movement was actually this report by the Surgeon General of the United States. In, the, in 1964, this is the 50th anniversary, the Surgeon General, who at that time at least was a respected medical professional in the United States um, and known by all, uh, issued his report of the association between smoking and health. This was a seminal moment in the United States that really woke a number of people up to the realities uh, of the health consequences of smoking, had a significant impact uh, at a government level and within individuals uh, in terms of smoking cessation and really kick-started all of the processes that we continue to try and fight in the war against smoking. Uh, uh, a, a seminal moment, because prior to that, really had, it had been given very little airplay Smoking is the single most important reversible factor that drives cardiovascular disease. You have complete control over it. Um, and it's not a multifactorial problem. Um, and uh, uh, this report had a, an enormous impact uh, in terms of our approach to lifestyle modification. This slide summarises really what are major, the, the major take home messages of the Framingham study and, and a number of other cohort studies that have come, on, come along since and very much can confirm the same types of observations. The reality is that there are a number of factors that are associated with the likelihood whether you will have a, have a heart attack or a stroke. Um, diabetes, high levels of cholesterol, high levels of triglyceride, the other form of fat in the blood, low forms of HDL, the good form of cholesterol, obesity, smoking, hypertension, the most common risk factor we see worldwide, and then finally a family history of premature heart disease. These are unequivocally associated with cardiovascular risk. There seems to be enormous debate in the media about whether the, some of these factors are or are not the cause for heart disease. There is not one cause of heart disease. There are many causes of heart disease. There are many causes of an individual's heart disease, and the combination of those causes differ between everybody in this room. So, when I have people say to me, well, this whole saturated fat story isn't right, saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease or it didn't cause it in this cohort, I can show you a cohort where it did. And my, my reflection is that if the causes of heart disease are A to Z, we probably know A to F. Uh, we know a lot, but we have a long way to go. Uh, but how we try and take that population data and then try and apply it to an individual becomes the real challenge because the reality is not everybody with a high cholesterol will have an event. Uh, not everybody with a low cholesterol will be spared from having an event. But we know across populations they do. And so uh, right now, in the absence of being able to intensively tailor our approaches to predicting risk, these are the findings that very much drive the way that we try to tailor our preventive strategies in clinical practice. We've really seen an evolution of the phenotype of who our cardiovascular patient is. I mean, there really was a time when, it, you know, most of our cardiac patients really looked like the guys from Mad Men. You know, they were your you know, middle-aged executives who smoked a lot, but the reality is that's not who has heart attacks these days. Most of our coronary cares are full with Homer Simpson. Our population has become fatter, and associated with that has come all of those metabolic complications, diabetes, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low forms of uh, HDL, the good forms of cholesterol. It's very much what's driving the disease. It's driving that global spread of the disease, and it very much reflects the changing phenotype of the patient that we see in our clinical practice. We are what we eat. Um, Rather than get into 
too many arguments about, well, is it saturated fat or not? Is it increasing consumption of sugar or not? The reality is we eat too much. We've increasingly eaten too much over the courses of decades and we've just become as a population an obese population. The reality is that the data is very strong to suggest that saturated fat does have an adverse effect at the level of the artery wall. Um, the data does suggest that you know, increased sugar consumption is equally important and I think what's got caught in the middle has been personal issues and debates over the years have really kind of distracted from what's supposed to be a fairly clean message about a reduction in consumption of saturated fat, not elimination of it, a reduction in consumption of sugar, an overall reduction in the amount of food that we consume. Um, we know that this is an inflammatory disease. I've shown you some of that data already with some of the early cartoons. The inflammatory cells play an important role at every stage of the process. They're there at the start, they're there in the middle, and it's the inflamed plaques that rupture and cause the heart attack at four o'clock in the morning. We now have very strong data to suggest that circulating markers of inflammation in the blood identify an individual who's more likely to have a heart attack um, over time. We know that some of the benefit of some of the treatments we already use appears to be related to a reduction in inflammation. So statins, yes, they work because they lower LDL, the bad form of cholesterol, but some of their benefits appear to be derived because they reduce inflammation. This is going to be critical in terms of how we look forward. Do we develop better markers, better therapies to, to target this effect? Um, we understand that some of this is not our own doing in that you know, we're born with genes. Uh, are there specific genes for heart attacks? And there are a number of families now where there are large cohorts of uh, premature heart disease, where there appears to be genes that are linked in those families associated with an elevated risk of heart attack. Again, heart disease is a complicated process. It is highly unlikely that it's going to be a one cause, one gene process. So uh, it, 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 yes, it, it, it emphasises the importance of the interaction between the genes that we have and the environment that we ultimately expose those genes to. Um, but it really still continues to present an enormous challenge for us in how we apply that moving forward in terms of can we really use genetics to predict risk, tailor therapy? The answer, at least right now, is no. Um, so what can we do? Um, lifestyle measures can have a big impact, and they have had a big impact. We've seen a reduction in smoking rates. Um, you know, we, where, where we see uh, reductions in food consumption, fat consumption, uh, obesity rates, we see actually the benefits in terms of reduction in cardiovascular risk. And we see that even at the other end from an obesity perspective with recent, uh, recent reports showing the cardiovascular benefits of surgery for obesity. You know, while that type, those types of procedures are somewhat extreme, they have rapid, profound cardiovascular benefits. So lifestyle measures can have uh, an enormous impact. The coronary care unit we take uh, for granted every day when we walk into the hospital, but may be one of the single most important developments that has changed the outcome for patients with heart attacks. In the early 50s, uh, common practice for a patient who survived to make it to hospital with a heart attack was to be admitted to hospital and to be put in a side room as far down the corridor away from the nurse's station as they could possibly be. And the instructions were made to not, not bother those individuals and to see if they would survive. And if they were there in the morning, well, that was a good thing. Um, Desmond Julian in the United Kingdom said, no, that's the wrong way to do it. These individuals are at high risk. They're at high risk of having further events, in particular, they're high risk of having nasty rhythm disturbances and sudden death episodes. And in fact, what we need to have is we need to have them all lined up right in front of us all night. And we need to have them monitored. And the second they go into one of those abnormal rhythms, we need to do, get there and do CPR and shock them. And in fact, what you see uh, in the lower right-hand part of this slide was a patient of Julian's who he included in a, one of his early reports who in fact had survived six resuscitation attempts during the one hospitalisation with a heart attack. And it really made a profound difference. And if you talk to nurses who staffed coronary care units in the 60s and 70s, they spent most of their night up resuscitating patients because 
In those days, you didn't get to hospital early. We had no way to open up arteries. You really just had the damage that you had. And so you were really at the mercy of somebody else with regards to what was going to happen to you. But at the very least, we could stop you from dying suddenly in the middle of the night. That made an enormous impact in terms of reducing adverse outcomes for patients who at least were able to survive to hospital. And then we entered really a seminal period of performing large clinical trials. There's a quote by one of the kind of preeminent people in our field uh, to suggest that the job of a trialist is ultimately just to work out whether a new intervention is either fairly useless or completely useless. Um, but the reality is that it's been one of the successes of my field, the ability to perform large clinical trials in 20 to 30,000 individuals at up to 1,000 hospitals around the world. And the insights that we've been able to bring from those trials have changed the way that we treat our patients. And they do that because we've been able to demonstrate in those large trials that by doing into specific interventions compared to just what we did before, that we reduce the chances that you died. And so when I say to my medical students on rounds, why do we do the following thing to our patients? The answer is because there's a mortality benefit. And that's a very, very strong uh, outcome to support using the therapies that we do in these very high-risk patients. We've learned that concept that early treatment reduces muscle damage. The focus has been predominantly on the blood clot, that concept of can we deliver aspirin early? Can we deliver medications that uh, bust up clot? Um, could we use that angioplasty and stent uh, approach, which has really become our kind of uh, major form of treating a patient who presents acutely with a heart attack. And then in more recent years, can we add more therapies to thin the blood even more? Because we know that not only is it a blood clot that blocks the artery off and is causing the immediate problem, but one of the major problems for those patients if they survive in the next 30 days is actually forming more blood clots. So in fact, it's now become standard of care that patients with a heart attack will go home with two blood thinners, and they'll probably stay on two blood thinners for at least 12 months. Again. The reason we use those therapies is because the large clinical trials told us that if you, you treated with those strategies, you were less likely to die, have a heart attack, have a stroke. These are major clinical benefits. And then we did clinical trials that showed that in addition to getting the artery open early, if we administered a range of therapies such as beta blockers, which we'd used in clinical practice for more than 20 years, although perhaps didn't know why we were really using them, or other medications that reduce blood pressure. Yes, they reduce the blood pressure control uh, in our patients, but the major benefit was they were reducing the amount of damage. By reducing the amount of damage, they reduce the likelihood of having heart failure and those nasty rhythm disturbances that we've talked about. Again, they translate to a mortality benefit in the clinical trials. Now, are some diets better than others? Dietary studies are enormously complicated, whether they are observational studies of populations or whether they are clinical trials, it is enormously difficult to evaluate the effect of one, composition, one component of a diet compared to another in a large clinical trial. And, and so the reality is that when the results of these are reported uh, in great journals like The Advertiser, um, that uh, one has to be somewhat sceptical. I read last week that Earl Grey tea was more effective at reducing cardiovascular events than statins. Suspect that probably wasn't the case. Uh, but it really highlights the complexity of trying to draw too many inferences from dietary studies. Um, where these studies work really well is where the investigators actually don't try to micromanage the study too much and actually compare a strategy. And in fact, what I think is the most elegant dietary study that's been performed in our field, in fact, is, is quite recent. It was reported last year. The Spaniards love their Mediterranean diet. They took individuals who were at high risk of having a heart attack. They had diabetes or they had multiple risk factors. These were not individuals who'd already had a heart attack, but they were at high risk of having one. And they randomised them to three groups. Two of them were asked to have a Mediterranean diet, one with some extra virgin olive oil that was provided on the side. Uh, one which was uh, uh, complemented with uh, an assortment of mixed nuts. And then the third was just a normal standard diet. 
And what they did was they brought these individuals in every few months and they sat them in little focus groups and they talked about Mediterranean diets. So not only did they explain it to them at the start, but they reinforced it, but basically they tested a strategy. They didn't try to say, okay, we're gonna have this much saturated fat and we're gonna have that much nut and this much cholesterol. They tested a completely viable diet that's used by millions of individuals. And you see here that over a five year period, there was really a dramatic effect the Mediterranean diets were associated with a 30% lower likelihood of having a cardiovascular be, uh, event uh, compared to the individuals who just had a standard diet. And it really highlights the importance of a Mediterranean diet and all that comes along with it. It's a diet that I think is rich in polyunsaturated fats, um, certainly lower in saturated fats. Uh, but there are a whole range of other components uh, to, to a Mediterranean diet that I think are likely to have contributed to the benefit uh, here. And, and, and given the way they went about doing that study and the way they didn't try to micromanage or over infer, the results are far more believable than most of the data we've seen. Now, we saw alarming reports on the ABC uh, late last year that the cholesterol story was a myth propagated by the medical community and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, here's the data in the next two slides that unequivocally demonstrate uh, the falsity of that statement. In, in follow-up to all the data we'd seen, and Nitschkov's seminal observations with the rabbits, all the population data, all the cell studies showing that if you do something to LDL cholesterol, the bad form of cholesterol, it does bad things to the cells that are present in the wall of the artery. We now have a large body of data from large clinical trials showing that if you lower LDL cholesterol, predominantly with a statin, but we've seen it with other therapies, if you lower LDL cholesterol levels, you lower the likelihood that you will die, have a heart attack, or have a stroke. And that has been unequivocally demonstrated in both individuals who've already had a heart attack, the so-called secondary, secondary prevention individuals, and in those individuals who have yet to have their heart disease become clinically expressed. Now, the greatest benefit is clearly in those individuals who've already had an event, because they are the ones who are most likely to have another event. And so, what it was unfortunate with the Catalyst program is really, I think they took the wrong argument. If the argument had have been, do we treat too many people in our community with a statin, the answer very well could have been yes. Uh, but by propagating a story that there's no link between cholesterol and heart disease and there's no benefit from cholesterol lowering is, is clearly not true, uh, but has a downflow effect of taking my patients who have had heart attacks in which the data is quite conclusive that they should be on a statin and they come off their statin. And so they come into my clinic and proudly announce that they're no longer on a statin because the ABC program told them not to. Uh, this will be the next wave of heart attacks and strokes as those patients' cardiovascular risk, which should be reduced, if not prevented, from being on these therapies, which have good, clear data from clinical trials, um, they will not be adhering with those agents. We've used our imaging approach to be able to look at the effects of medical therapies on the natural history of plaque progression. And we know that if you have plaques in the arteries and we come back and image the same artery later on, there'll be more plaque. The natural history is that it grows. And we can use these techniques to actually look and see if medical therapies slow the growth of plaque, or in fact, even better, can they cause plaque to actually shrink? So this is data from our collective experience using the ultrasound that we place within the coronary arteries themselves. And what it shows is that there's a clear direct relationship between the level of LDL cholesterol and the rate at which your plaque grows. And in fact, what we learned, and these are in US units, if you get your LDL cholesterol below about 1.8 millimoles per litre, it actually, that's the level at which your plaque starts to shrink. And why that's an interesting number is because if you look at our treatment guidelines that we use in clinical practice, what we target an LDL for our patients who have already got established heart disease, we try to get their LDL less than 1.8. So getting them to those levels, we can actually start to remove the plaques that have been growing in the walls of the arteries for decades. Similarly, blood pressure, the results are unequivocal. The population data shows that there's a relationship. The higher your blood pressure, 
the greater the likelihood that you'll have an event. The studies show us that if you take patients who have high levels of blood pressure and you lower it, you reduce the likelihood that they'll have an event. And again, it very much reflects our use of these agents in clinical practice is guided by the fact that large clinical trials of tens of thousands of individuals show that by doing these, uh, by adopting these strategies, we reduce the likelihood that you will die, you'll have a heart attack, or you'll have a stroke. These are major clinical benefits that drive what it is that we do in clinical practice. So what is it we need to do moving into the future? We need to continue to fight the war in preventing heart disease in the first place. This is the National Heart Foundation's take on how we do as a community. One in six of us still smoke. Two in three of us are over overweight or obese. Two in three of us either do little or no exercise whatsoever. And one in two of us don't meet the recommended daily intake of fruit and vegetables. And I think the advertiser might have implied one in three of our children in Adelaide uh, don't consume much in terms of fruit and vegetables at all uh, yesterday. So we continue to fail with the simple things uh, that can have an enormous impact uh, in preventing disease from forming in the first place. We need to be better at responding to nasty heart rhythms in the community. And while the coronary care unit has been an enormous success, the reality is that the majority of people have those nasty rhythms and sudden death episodes away from hospitals. Um, we are doing a better job of having more individuals in the community learn CPR. We're doing a better job of having automatic defibrillators in public spaces. I've seen three patients on my coronary care calls this year who were arrested at Adelaide Airport and were quickly resuscitated with the defibrillators that are on the walls there. It really speaks to the importance of being able to restore an adequate heart rhythm quickly. Um, and I think it's a civic responsibility that as many of us as possible should learn resuscitation techniques and how to use this. And, as, uh, and governments need to be more responsible in being able to make it uh, easier for automatic defibrillators to be present in uh, uh, more and more public places. Uh, we were having a discussion beforehand. I, I, I couldn't be assured whether there was one in this room. Uh, so the university have taken that uh, on board. Um, we need new therapies. Um, there will be new ways to lower the bad forms of cholesterol. Not everybody likes to take a statin. They cause aches and pains, uh, and it becomes a real challenge. Um, not everybody on a statin gets their LDL cholesterol levels to the levels that we want. And then above and beyond that, we feel that the job's only half done. If we're lucky, we get most people's LDLs down to one and a half. We're born with an LDL of about 0.7. I think anything more than that's just greedy. So we have drugs that are being developed in clinical practice now and are going through trials that may actually have the capacity on top of a statin to lower an LDL down to those neonatal types of levels. Um, we'll ultimately see whether that will have a greater impact from clinical trials. We need to aggressively target obesity and we need to really do it at two fronts. We need to accept that our major war should be in trying to prevent it in the first place. But the reality is that we face a lot of obesity in our clinical practice. And so we have really struggled to develop good treatments for our obese individuals. We need new agents for diabetes. Diabetes is a major risk factor for heart disease. Controlling diabetes uh, reduces the likelihood that you'll go blind and your kidneys will fail, but it actually doesn't reduce the chance that you'll have a heart attack or a stroke. We need better treatments for diabetes that not only improve the glucose control and make the numbers look better, but actually result in a much greater likelihood that you will be protected from having one of those events. We need to harness the potential of the good form of cholesterol. This really has been an unfulfilled promise for a number of decades, the idea that HDL may protect from having a heart attack or a stroke, but we still have failed to develop one treatment that targets HDL that actually results in benefit. Again, we're doing large clinical trials, some of them which we're leading out of SAMRI, uh, where we will uh, evaluate the effects of some of these treatments. And then finally, that concept of inflammation that very well may underscore all the risk factors and tie everything together. Can we develop specific treatments that target the inflammatory factors in the artery wall that drive the disease process? That's yet to occur, but again, we wait for those clinical trials to happen. We need better tests. We need to be able to try and pick who's got the plaque that's going to rupture. 
and who's got the plaques that are more likely to respond for me treating you with this treatment as opposed to that treatment. If we want to move to, be, to a situation where we can personalise our approach to predicting risk, triaging patients to different treatments and then monitoring the effects of those treatments, we need better markers, whether it be imaging or blood-based markers to do that. So there continues to be a lot of activity to work out those approaches. Can we fix a damaged heart? And the concept of the stem cell, can we deliver stem cells, whether it's a direct injection into the heart, whether it's administered via one of those catheters, and can we actually deliver that to an area of damaged heart with the right nutrients to make those cells turn into heart muscle cells and reform a nice, strong, beating heart? Again, this remains a hope of our field, but a hope that to date has been unfulfilled. Um, and I'll finish with two final statements. For all the technological advances that we've seen with regards to heart disease, particularly in our community, we fail the greatest with the ones that are most disadvantaged. And closing the gap continues to be uh, an enormous challenge. We have a population in this country who have the worst cardiovascular outcomes in the world, our own indigenous population. Uh, and they have a nasty form of disease. They're out terrible when they come to attention and our ability to get the right treatments to these individuals, both from a preventive and an acute treatment perspective, remain uh, suboptimal and, and embarrassing. Uh, so we need continued efforts in how we take the interventions that we've already established are good and get them to the right people. And then finally, this was an editorial that was written by Michael Brown and Joseph Goldstein in Science in 1996. Brown and Goldstein won the Nobel Prize in 1985 for discovering the, the role of the receptor on the liver surface that controlled cholesterol metabolism. And that really was important in understanding how statins would work. And then we went to the clinical trials that showed that statins reduced heart attack, stroke and death. And they ultimately then wrote this editorial in 1996, Heart Attacks Gone with the Century. We've got a long way to go. And on that note, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you, Steve. Now, uh, Steve's prepared to field some questions. If anyone has a question uh, they would like to ask. Do we have microphones? Uh, yeah, there's a microphone on its way. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. Um, I'll continue to drink Earl Grey tea, even if it has no effect. But you mentioned several times that heart attacks occur in the middle of the night. Is that in fact the case? And if so, why? So, so it's interesting if you plot a 24-hour cycle, it's not evenly distributed over, the, over a 24-hour time clock. And there does seem to be a spike of heart attacks occurring at about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, this has uh, prompted an enormous amount of research to try and understand that. We know that the stickiness of your blood probably fluctuates over the course of a day. And for some reason, it's probably more sticky at that time uh, of the 24-hour cycle. Um, we don't know enough about that inflammatory pattern of disease and whether the factors uh, are, are kind of fluctuating over that time course. But you know, the reality is that uh, whether it's just to annoy my interventional colleagues who I have to wake up and get to come in and open up an artery at 4 o'clock in the morning, there do appear to be more events that occur at that time of the day. Uh, Professor, our uh, red wine industry keeps reassuring us that uh, their product's extremely good for us. Can you give us any indications on that uh, uh, parameter, if you like? It's always, it's always, you can always be guaranteed that the red wine question will come. Uh, and you can always be guaranteed it's never in my talk. And uh, the reality is that I think that there are some components of a number of alcohol forms, red wine in particular, that appear to be protective. Uh, um, and it's the challenge for us is, is, is how we as a profession make recommendations around that. So 
moderate consumption of alcohol, particularly wine, uh, does appear to be associated with some reduction in risk. Um, one has to balance that with uh, a whole host of other health issues and consequences that come along with uh, moderate and perhaps not quite so moderate consumption uh, of alcohol. As, you know, as, as, you know, but our understanding for really why that occurs is it remains fairly limited. Professor Brooks, maybe we can uh, get our uh, the wine industry to support an entire research initiative or something like that uh, into heart disease. <coughs> Could you comment on the uh, effectiveness of aspirin in primary and secondary prevention? So aspirin in secondary prevention is, uh, there's no doubt whatsoever the benefits. It's a reduction in mortality, it's a reduction in heart attack and stroke. And as I said, I think it really reflects two processes. One, that a blood clot really is uh, one of the major problems going on there and then at the, at the time. And it's really become standard of care that the ambulance officers will give you aspirin in the back of the van. You don't wait to get to hospital to get it. Uh, but then a lot of the events that will occur, particularly over the next kind of few months in particular, will be related to more blood clots. You're at a higher risk of forming clots. And so, so aspirin makes a lot of sense. Um, the primary prevention data is been a little bit more challenging. And, and keep in mind that one of the challenges with primary prevention studies, and these are studies of individuals who haven't yet had an event, is that the overall event rate is actually a lot lower. So you've got to study a lot of patients, right? And, and that becomes the challenge. You've got to study, probably in a contemporary era, 30 plus thousand patients in a trial. These are massive studies uh, and uh, to, to show benefits. And then when you see the benefit, the degree of benefit and the number needed to treat uh, to actually see that benefit eventuate out in the real world uh, becomes quite small. And so the, the aspirin data from primary prevention has always been a little questionable. We would still largely reserve it for our really high risk individuals um, who haven't had an event, but we just kind of treat them like they've had an event. Um, but you know, it, it's one of those areas where the data is not quite as solid. We've got to keep in mind that you know we expose a lot of people in primary prevention to a drug that is going to make you bleed, and it may be just you know cutting yourself, shaving, or it may be bleeding from an ulcer. So you know we we have to weigh those factors up: the the risks and the benefits. I understand there's a time frame for getting to hospital and getting clot busting drugs if you have a stroke, that after a couple of hours, you they're not so effective. Is the same thing apply to myocardial infarction? So, in fact, the neurologists really have followed, uh, you know, our path. Um, you know, we, we've been pleased to see, and, and stroke's very complicated because clearly not every stroke's because you block an artery. You know, a lot of strokes still occur due to spontaneous bleed, small vessel disease. These are these are events that are not going to be uh, impacted positively by by giving those types of drugs. Uh, but if you can get to hospital within the first three or four hours, you can have a CAT scan and show that you haven't had a bleed. There's now very good data from clinical trials that suggest that stroke, stroke patients do better uh, if they've been given those drugs. That, that follows decades of experience with regards to myocardial infarction. The data for, in fact, giving those agents preceded the stent era. So you know, studies that were started to be performed in the mid 80s through to the early 90s clearly demonstrated that if you could get to hospital very quickly, the first kind of six, eight hours in particular, you benefited. The longer, if, if you kind of waited beyond that, the benefits clearly start to kind of taper off because you're already doing the damage to the heart muscle. Now that we have stents, we rarely use these agents because it enables for you to open the artery up and we actually have data from clinical trials showing that it's superior to giving the medications to dissolve the blood clot. But it does another important thing. It enables for you to look at all the other blockages at the same time. And so it may be that that person who presents at four o'clock in the morning, and in fact, I, I had an example of this two weeks ago. A man that presented with a heart attack had a blocked artery which was opened up. He actually had extensive blockages elsewhere, and he's gone on to have a bypass operation. <coughs> 
Uh, and so you get that kind of double benefit for, for doing that. But it's largely driven by the fact that the trials tell us that patients do better. So we'll take one last question. Uh, following on from the aspirin story and blood thinning, uh, some many surgeons, I've had surgeons tell me to stop taking fish oil even in advance of stop taking aspirin when entering even relatively minor surgical procedures. Yeah, fish oil is interesting uh, and there's a couple of elements to, uh, to the fish oil story. Um, fish oils can certainly thin blood a little bit. Surgeons don't like patients on lots of blood thinners. They like to cut people open and then for the, kind of close them up and they just don't bleed. It's a, it's a, it's a good day for a surgeon. Uh, and um, so if they, whatever they can get you to stop a number of days in advance, they're going to get you to do it. And the fish oil actually is the absolute first thing to stop because right now the data for fish oil actually providing major health benefits is, is a little bit limited. I mean, it's got benefits in uh, joint disease, a number of other uh, disease processes, but coming off it for a few days isn't going to cause a major health consequence, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, but we know that fish oils do a lot of other things. They lower your triglycerides, those bad fats in the blood. Uh, they may have some rhythm protective benefits as well. Um, we generally want to hope that fish oils are actually protective, but we've done a lot of trials, most of them very, very badly, and we've not been able to show that. So in fact, what we're just launching right now is a 12,000 patient study worldwide of patients with vascular disease who are already on a statin, whose triglycerides are a little elevated, and they're going to be randomised to fish oil or a placebo and to see whether that has a clinical benefit. And it's not just fish oil, it's four grams a day. That's a lot. So part of the challenge with fish oil is that I have 100 people come and see me uh, in my clinic and they'll all take a fish oil. They'll all be taking some different extract of fish oil. And you know, most of it's over the counter. You don't actually know how much is in. I've actually started asking people to bring it with them uh, to their next visit so we can actually try and establish what they're really taking. But if we can actually uh, establish that giving large quantities of the real deal is cardioprotective, then it may be uh, a nice new treatment for all of our patients moving forward, but we have to do those trials. Well, thank you very much, Steve. That's been a fantastic lecture. I've enjoyed it enormously. And uh, we have a little thank you gift for you, which I believe you have to take in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.